Hello, and welcome to Macrodose Roundtable, the show where we go in-depth with some of the brightest minds from the worlds of economics and ecology. Macrodose Roundtables are an opportunity to expand some of the ideas introduced in our short, sharp 15-minute roundups in a longer-form, multi-guest format. My name is Sarah Jaffe, and I'll be your host for today. I'm a labor journalist and the author of Work Won't Love You Back. And today I'm talking with two writers and thinkers that I've enjoyed being in conversation with for years, whose work on money, neoliberal capitalism, the state and its discontents, cryptocurrency, conspiracy theories, and so much more has shaped the way I see the world. And thanks to Macrodose, I get to bully them into joining me for this wide-ranging conversation. Quinn Slobodian's most recent book is Crack Up Capitalism, Market Radicals, and the Dream of a World Without Democracy, published by Metropolitan Books in the U.S., Penguin in the U.K., in Germany, France, and elsewhere. He is professor of international history at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies at Boston University, contributing writer to The New Statesman, co-editor of Contemporary European History, and co-director of the History and Political Economy Project. Brett Scott is a journalist, campaigner, monetary anthropologist, and former financial broker. He's the author of Cloud Money, Cash, Cards, Crypto, and the War for Our Wallets, Penguin in 2022, and The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, Pluto Press 2013. He writes the Altered States of Monetary Consciousness newsletter at brettscott.substack.com. Thank you guys for being here. Welcome to Macrodose. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, so I've been thinking about this conversation for a while, but today my news hook is uh, Javier Millet, who is the, uh, the new president of Argentina and has already, I think, seven weeks into his uh, tenure, already provoked a general strike in Argentina this week. So um, Quinn, you've written about Millet for the New Statesman when he was elected. So I'm going to ask you to tell us who he is and what he's doing and then ask Brett to explain dollarization after that. I'm glad that's the division of labor. Yes. Um, so Javier Millet is a trained economist who was a, sort of an outsider to politics until quite recently, but staged this kind of barn burner of a campaign over a couple of uh, voting cycles to become now the president of Argentina. And the reason I think you're bringing him up and the reason why he's kind of a uh, a unicorn on the political scene is that he's, I think, the first avowed anarcho-capitalist head of state. Um, I mentioned this to someone else, and they wondered if Hans Adam II, Prince of Liechtenstein, might actually be the other. But this is, let's say, the first anarcho-capitalist head of a large state. And it seems like a contradiction in terms because anarcho-capitalists technically... Uh, disavow states altogether, and they believe that all things that are normally the the domain of governments should be replaced by private service providers and contractors. So there's already a kind of contradiction or irony that you have this you know, this guy not only speaking as the president, but speaking uh, as of last week at the World Economic Forum in Davos as the kind of avenging angel of capitalism. Um, his playbook so far, you know, other than the dollarization, which thankfully Brett will explain to us, is a combination of kind of just austerity plus. I mean, this is the this is the claim that he's just going to do the unpleasant shock therapy that will restore the Argentine economy back to some level of global trustworthiness and creditworthiness and competitiveness. Combined with uh, a very strong strain of authoritarian crackdown on dissent and um, protest within the nation. So it involves criminalizing some forms of um, opposition to the government. It involves the potential rollback of the rather recent legalization of abortion in Argentina. He is an avowed pro pro lifer. Um, which I think is consistent with his libertarian beliefs. I don't know if we'll get around to that. but um, So he is uh, someone that sort of leapt straight from the pages of the book that I just finished uh, in the sense that he is a, a, a sort of a follower of Murray Rothbard who had written years ago, some 30 years ago, a kind of list of things to do 
to carry out an effective uh, program of right-wing populism in a libertarian manner. And Millet is quite likely literally reading Rothbart. He had named one of his dogs after him. He obviously thinks highly of him. He's deep in the kind of the Reddit weeds of the Austrian school. He name-checked Israel Kurtzner, who you know, almost nobody has heard of except for deep, like, Austrian school libertarian heads in his World Economic Forum speech. So that's that's him in a nutshell, I guess, is sort of, like, mostly just a ramped-up version of IMF-style austerity shock therapy as usual, but with this added frisson of this peculiar economic subculture, which is now sort of having its turn on the world stage. Yeah, so we will get into why this is uh, all quite consistent with libertarianism. But Brett, yeah, dollarization, what and why? All right. Um, well, I mean, in principle, it's, it's, it's kind of simple, but I guess in practice, it's not. In principle, it's like when you replace your national currency with the U.S. dollar. Um, I mean, if you think about it, like there was a process of Euro Eurofication for all the European countries at some point, right? They essentially got rid of their national currencies and replaced it with a currency issued by the ECB. Right? Um, but during that process, and during that process, they lost control of the currency. So the central banks of Europe no longer have any power in and of themselves. Right? But they had some sort of collaborative process via which they did that and hold, held on to various aspects of the governance of the euro. Whereas when you're dollarizing, you're basically joining the kind of dollar zone, as it were, but without any actual um, <laughs> rights or assistance from the U.S. state. You're basically just sort of unilaterally doing it. Uh, a process would basically involve your central bank losing all its power, right? Which is part of the political project, perhaps, of certain libertarians. To say, our central bank is uh, badly run and so on, so essentially defer power to an imperialistic currency that's the Federal Reserve, you know, right? Um, and it would also be an incredibly difficult thing to do, I imagine. It would probably require like a massive influx of U.S. dollars. Um, to like, Essentially, because imagine you have all your citizens in the country who will have bank accounts, or at least some of them will, which will be denominated in pesos. But then you're going to have to replace all of those with U.S. dollars, which basically involves the central bank having to replace all its reserves of its own currency with U.S. dollars plus... And, then, and so to, for this process to, to work. So it would require a massive injection of U.S. dollars into the country, which I'm not sure they'd be able to do anyway. Um, but the basic idea is he, he wants to try and clamp down on inflation through this process. Um, I don't know if that would actually work. I mean, I have some experience with dollarization because my family's from Zimbabwe, and Zimbabwe dollarized its, its a currency. Right? So the Zimbabwe dollar went through hyperinflation. And then the Zimbabwe government had to basically scrape U.S. dollars from somewhere to try and, like, restart the monetary system. Um, it's a very controversial process, though, because you basically yoke yourself to the U.S. system and lose a bunch of monetary policy tools in the process. Um, so, yeah, Ecuador, El Salvador, all these countries are all dollarized. It basically means they have no control over their monetary policy. But to, can I just jump in there? But but to what extent is that just being honest about the fact that, you know, they don't have much control of their monetary policy anyway? Is that the attraction of this, the kind of like the stark realism of it, however depressing? Like, yeah, I mean, that's that's one way of putting it. Um, but, you know, countries can do other things, you know, they can devalue and they can do all sorts of stuff. They can they can they can issue new money. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Typically. Not that they have necessarily a lot of power or leeway to do that, but it's still something you can technically do. So uh, there's another form of, uh, in the opposite, opposite direction, people who are going against dollarization, which you'll find, for example, you know, a lot of radical politicians in Ecuador and stuff and around the world who are against dollarization. There's different forms. Uh, the one form is you're trying to reverse like a hard dollarized country to say we want to go back to, a cur to our original currency. The other version, though, is to say we want to get rid of dependence upon the U.S. dollar for international trade, right? The so-called reserve currency status of the U.S. dollar, which basically means, you know, when countries are, or when companies or whatever are doing international transactions, they're often going via the U.S. dollar system, which gives the U.S. a bunch of political power, right? For example, it can impose sanctions via, like, the SWIFT network through this process, um, which is why then China and Russia and all these places will want to get rid of that U.S. dollar reserve system and have their own system so that they can bypass sanctions, because um, it becomes a tool of geopolitical power. 
Um, so there are other interviews in which Brett explains all of these systems in detail, and this we're going to do not, things a little I'm differently. Not ex- <laughs> I'm not actually an expert in international dollarization, so I'm not, I'm not really like... No. <laughs> Shh, you're fine. Um, for the, for our purposes, this is plenty. Um, cause like Mila is just a news hook for this conversation. Um, partly he's gotten so much hype because he's kind of a weirdo, right? He like cosplays as Captain Anne Cap. Um, there are other cosplayers in Quinn's book. Um, there's Mencius Moldbug who shows up in both of your books. The dude from the Mighty Ducks who wanted to, um, Bitcoinize Puerto Rico. Like these people can seem funny. We've already been laughing, but they're also winning um, in a lot of ways. So before we dig into more details, I, I just wanted to sort of ask you each briefly, like, why do you think this particular strand of libertarianism, anarcho-capitalism, whatever we want to call it, is having a moment right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the, there's two ways of answering that. The one is to address this sort of LARPing or cosplay aspect to it, which I talk about a bit in, in my book, because you know, it's a familiar sort of slur on the left, right, to say someone is LARPing X, Y, or Z or cosplaying X, Y, or Z. And um, the interesting thing about having someone like David Friedman, Milton Friedman's son, as an actual, you know, pioneer of LARPing, like a big time, like creative anachronist, reenactor, is it sort of makes you ask, like, what happens if rather than resisting the LARPing impulse, you kind of lean into it heavily. Um, And that move hasn't been made so much, I think, on the left, but the embrace of that by some of these ANCAPs makes you see that it actually has a bit of a political payload to it, potentially, especially in the sort of like highly digitally mediated landscape of, of sort of swarm politics that we're existing in right now. What I mean by that is if you do... Uh, what Millet did to sort of abandon respectability politics, like literally put on like a leotard and grab like a trident and like go to a comic convention. You know, all the kind of common sense around politics should be like, oh, you've just discredited yourself. There's no way you'll ever be able to enter office. But actually, in a place like Argentina, which, you know, notably recently lowered the voting age to 16, and you have a lot of people who are, consuming politics in bite-sized, you know, TikTok segments, YouTubes, then this is a way to actually mark yourself as being, you know, not part of the establishment, however counterfeit that pose might be. So the, that kind of form of personality-driven politics, um, which embraces a kind of absurd version of a prefigurative politics by saying we're going to you know perform the coming world and the coming world is one in which we will all be able to totally abandon our existing um, forms of sociability and, and being is um, is a way to stand out and it's a and it's a way to create a kind of a pole of attraction I think in a kind of deadened and um, flattened uh, realm of kind of political affect so that's I think the the reason why it can work, but it's notable that it can only work when it's traveling with the stream, right? I mean, in the era of zero interest rate policy, when you know money was free and investors were willing to throw you know cash at any new harebrained crypto scheme emanating from Silicon Valley or elsewhere, then it was another kind of you know it was a blood sport of the attention economy, which is like how outlandish can you make your investment scheme be? And that that would never be a handicap, right? You're actually producing kind of interest in eyeballs and clicks and swipes and so on. Um, So I think that, you know, if you do politics that is friendly to the global investor class, which obviously these kinds of in the end, anarcho- anarcho-capitalism and libertarianism are useful for and you know, amenable to existing hierarchies of, of, of class power, then you can get an audience. I think that the challenge for the left is to try to do that kind of politics when it works counter to the existing hierarchies of, of power, because then your goofy coin is not going to get you know, profiled in the Financial Times, like the Dogecoin might be or something. Rather, it'll be seen as like a sign of, you know, freakish um, political perversion or something. If you tried to dress up as, you know, I don't know, Captain Mao 
or, or you know, <laughs> like if we had if we had a real resurgence of the kind of stuff you had in a place like West Germany yeah. in, or France in the 60s and early 70s where people were like, we're Chinese, we're putting on padded coats, we're putting on caps, and we're yep. forming communes. Yep. That was LARPing. Yep. Um, I don't think that would go down this, as well as these other forms of anarcho-capitalist LARPing have been, so... Yeah. Yeah. I used to joke that I was going to run for office and just say all the things that I actually thought and see if I would get as much attention as, um, oh my God, do you remember the, the woman who did the, I'm not a witch commercial when she was running for Senate or whatever in like the 2010s early? Oh my God. What was her name? I'm gonna look it up while Brett talks. (laughs) Not Marion Williamson. No, not Marion Williamson. No, I like her. She's a good witch. I did her podcast actually. Um, She's a good witch. The other one was a bad witch. Anyway, this is, I am not anti-witch. We are pro-witch on this show. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, right, go anarch- on. I'm going to look up her name because I better remember what her name was. I mean, I think there's different types of anarcho-capitalists. And there's like real ones who are a little bit crazy. I mean, I've met the real ones. You, know, you used to find a lot of them in the, in the sort of the crypto circles. And actually, real anarcho-capitalists are often sort of weirdly naive and sweet. You know, a little bit like real transhumanists and stuff. They're kind of like really bizarrely sort of ideologically driven people who are almost... Um, imagine like an innocent child that sort of like has, has come to believe the world should be some way and then they, and they, it's, it's not actually that, that way and then they say it should be this way. Like they have a lot of this kind of stuff going on, right? Like in, in proper anarcho-capitalist circles, which is why they're actually viewed as being a bit like absurd by sort of more straightforward libertarians who, who are a bit, more, a bit more politically savvy, right? Um, so there's this kind of pure class of anarcho-capitalists and they, some of them like really authentically believe you can live on the ocean in a sea setting dwelling, right? And um, then you get this kind of more sort of perhaps cynical use of anarcho-capitalism as a kind of just like rhetorical tool, um, which I suppose is something that's like big in libertarianism more generally, right? You know, I used to work in the financial sector and all these like financiers used to claim they were libertarians, right? Even though they were more than happy to take all sorts of state contracts, blah, 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 right? But they basically realize it's very useful to deploy libertarian... um, but like, I guess like a platonic ideal of like, like a, a sort of some sort of weird ideal type capitalism that doesn't actually exist, right? And this is what, one of those interesting aspects of the dynamics in libertarianism is between the people who sort of authentically believe and those who are just cynically using it. And, and sometimes they can see each other and, and, they, and they, they can actually identify each other and they, can re- they realize it. Even in the crypto world, for example, there's like... So, so I'm just riffing here, but like there's a there's a guy who runs um what's his name um he runs a platform one of the big Kraken the guy who runs runs, runs Kraken is like a legit little bit libertarian, um where he actually believes he prioritizes an anti-government position over a profit-seeking position right because in typical libertarianism you'll have some version that says human nature is self-interested and pr- uh, p- pursuing your own private interest is naturally good, all right? That will tend to lead in libertarian thought to having in some anti-government position, but then there's this like problem that they have, which is actually you can make tons of profit from collaborating with governments, all right? And so some libertarians would be like, actually, I should pursue profit, and if that means working with the government, with my company, I'll do that. And there's, there's tons of those guys, right? Um, like Joe Lonsdale, for example, in Silicon Valley, the guy who runs Palantir, I mean, he works with governments all the time, and he's a self-avowed libertarian. Um, but like, so, so there's this weird dynamic going on. But I think one of the ways that I would t- sometimes look at it is, um, and please stop me if I'm rambling on too long here, but like uh, ideal types versus actually existings. So one of the, in the financial sector, one of the most amazing things is that people in the finance sector know that actual capitalism works with states and markets as a singular unit, Right. But, and that's the actually existing capitalism, you can deploy the ideal type imagination, which is like somehow states and markets are separate and so on, as a way to essentially reduce regulatory power in the actually existing system, right? And that's one of the biggest tools that they're always using is the sort of to to play off the the ideal type imagination versus the actually existing system. Um, and that's been my, my experience with libertarianism for a long time. And anarcho-capitalists, in some ways, are actually quite useful to some of the more straightforward libertarians because they're kind of like, they, they channel the most ideologically pure version of the ideal type 
imagination. Can I just say something about that, which is, you know, you mentioned Lonsdale, and who's like a protege of Peter Thiel. I think Peter Thiel is a perfect example of the, what you're describing. And it shows, I think, why, the, why libertarianism is an especially kind of labile and helpful ideology to subscribe to. Because if you believe, as you say, that, you know, that it is the nature, human nature to pursue kind of profit and to maximize at all, at all opportunities, then, yeah, I mean, if you can rent seek through public office, then rent seek through public office. You're actually, you're actually consistent with your own principles then. You, whether you're just taking, you know, your salary, if you're, even if you're taking bribes, then that's actually maximizing the, your, your position. So you could be, I think you could be a consistently libertarian, you know, corrupt machine politician, yeah. actually, yeah. which yeah. is maybe a good way to describe what Javier Millet is. Yeah trying right. to become. Yeah. I wanted to do give a pitch for, I think, kind of an underrated HBO series, The Anarchists. I don't know if you two have seen no. it, but it's it's exactly the strange bedfellow coalition that Brett is describing. It's set around the wonderfully named um, Anarchapulco convention uh, yeah, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. happening in Acapulco for a few years, yeah. which became a kind of, at the height of the kind of Bitcoin frenzy, became a magnet for all of these peculiar types. You had like young, like weed smoking kids with dreadlocks, like literally escaping, um, escaping drug regulation in the United States to come south to Mexico. You had, um, you know, big sunglass, pop pink dress shirt collar kind of crypto grifter hustler type YouTube guys. You had like really damaged Iraq war vets mm -hmm. who just felt like the government was out to get them and yeah. for good reason. And then you had people who were kind of, you know, deep in the tax ideologues, working themselves in one case literally to death through alcoholism Oof, yeah. and commitment to the cause. And this is actually a pretty good accurate representation of of how I think a successful ideology works, actually, because it can make many people see themselves in it, right? And in this case, in a totally destructive and zero-sum, like, pit of kind of social Darwinist, like, struggle. But, you know, it. I think I, I continue to think that um, we shouldn't reduce libertarianism to some simplistic caricature yeah. of just homo economicus or something. Yeah, yeah. Like it does have these, yeah. it ha has these diverse flavors that makes it attractive, especially to young and one, people. One of the most complex elements right now has been the um, fusion with sort of social conservatism, I guess like, I guess what they mm -hmm. call right populist libertarianism or something like that. I don't know what yeah. the official term is now. Um, yeah. But I've been at, you know, a lot of crypto type of events in the past where you'll find this tension emerging between really hardcore socially conservative libertarians versus those who kind of have some uh, vision of, um, I guess, social libertarianism. And it's interesting that in the Malay case, he seems to have some weird combination of these things going on, right? He's, he's, sort, of, he's sort of tacked on various sort of socially progressive, well, not socially progressive things, but like th the way he behaves and stuff doesn't come across as a traditional social conservative, um, and that's a sort of a, that's a common weirdness in libertarian culture. I, I always remember going to the the um, Liberty League Freedom Forum, which was this, this libertarian conference in the in, in the in the UK. And uh, one of the most amazing things in in UK libertarianism is that in reality it's just like aristocrats, right? Who don't want to pay taxes and stuff. That's that's the, the actual foundation of it because the sort of you know, platonic ideal of like individuals and stuff, an equal contract basically enables them to say that no exploitation happens in, in actual markets, right? So they can deploy it as a smokescreen to say that they are being, they, they are being abused by, you know, tax systems and so on. So that's the real core of it. But it will then attract all these people who like pro -le weed legalization and stuff like that, who then like will be hanging out with these very socially conservative, like um, essentially, you know, young Tory aristocrat types. Uh, who are like handing out business cards and trying to sort of basically do business networking while they're at the Liberty League Freedom Forum. And then there'll be others who sort of see that contradiction and, and, and sort of feel like the party here isn't very good. You know, this is like, you don't want to party with these people. Right? Um, and then one of the most interesting things with the, with the crypto sort of invasions was the kind of influx of party people into libertarian culture. 
right? So you started getting this kind of like fire festival, you know, porter, mm. you know, you, burning, you know man. burning man kind of like like stuff infusing into that sort of like economically conservative position. So so it really is a bizarre mix of of stuff actually in these in these things now. Well, when it's all patriarchy, it's still all patriarchy, um, she says, talking to two dudes. Um, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I would love to dig into the, the like ethical whatever of like Millet being against abortion, but like Melinda Cooper wrote that book. So um, everybody should read it, Melinda Cooper's um, Family Values book. Um, but I want to steer you back to both of your books, actually, because um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to get the two of you together is that like both of your books, in a way, are writing about this thing that I could sort of summarize as capitalism without democracy or even perhaps capitalism without people. Um, and I want to ask you each to sort of set the scene with that a little bit more by telling us how that plays out in your book. And this time I'm going to make Brett go first. I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm going to fully answer it, but cause I, I, I wouldn't have framed it like that myself. Uh, but, but I guess what I'm interested in, in, in cloud money is looking at, essentially systemic processes in a large scale capitalist system, um, which in very blunt terms, broad stroke terms, is often the internal tendencies towards acceleration and expansion. That's how I would frame it, that, right? This is like a kind of, I always imagine like a, a capitalist system as this giant network structure that's trying to like expand all the time, right? Um, that's a bit of, that's a bit reductionist, but that's uh, at some level that's always kind of what's happening, right? It doesn't always work. Sometimes it's like breaking down, but it's trying to do this this expansion and acceleration process, and that's something that's beyond the control of any individual person, right? So in some ways, it's not it's got nothing to do with human desire. It's to do with systemic emergent systemic forces. Um, but there are ideologies that will emerge that say that the things are happening because of human desire. So I look particularly at, at the rise of so-called cashless society, which is the you know, decline of physical money units, um, which is both a privatization process because the digital systems are largely run by private sector players, but it's also an automation. It's part of a, part of a broader automation process, right? Um, and... There's a very particular story that's told about that, which says, you know, everybody desi desires this. The reason why this is happening is that this ordinary people are choosing this thing and big corporates and stuff are just sort of sitting there in the background who are act acting as kind of like helpful servants for your desire, all right, uh, rather than active participants who are trying to, you know, move in these, uh, in the sort of prevailing direction of a large-scale capitalist system, right, which is... Uh, essentially scaling and, and, and accelerating. Um, and so cloud money is, you know, and then it's looking at how what we're seeing is the fusion of big finance and big tech in that process and an and a ideological attack on the cash system. Um, so I guess, you know, the, in terms of your capitalism without people question or capitalism without democracy question, the, I suppose my contribution there is, is, is sort of looking at how many governments and uh, largely feel that they have no actual power, right, in this, these, this global automation processes. So they will perceive themselves to have certain forms of local power, you know, but this, in terms of, say, acting against automation, they basically believe that they can't, right? Weirdly, the only politician recently that's stated uh, something against this would be Giorgia Maloney in, in Italy. She's the only politician, politician who came out and said, we can actually protect the cash system, all right? She's the only one who's, who's, who said, basically said, we can resist automation processes, right? All the rest were like, it's impossible. Progress basically entails having to get faster and more automated and more digitized. Uh, and there's nothing else, you, you can not, there's nothing you can do about that. The only thing you can do about it is either try to lead the way or else face being left behind, all right? And um, so a lot of my work is around that. And I suppose with like AI right now, that's a big, um, also a massive... Um, in the rhetoric of AI, the way it always starts is that sort of you, it'll, it'll be claimed that human desire is driving it, right? Oh, it's because it's convenient and we all desire this thing. But at some point, if you resist it, you'll be told, if you don't use it, you'll be shafted and left behind. So you better, you better sync up now, right? Which, so it's basically, AKA, it's got nothing to do with what you desire. It's got to do with what the system requires. Yeah. Um, and... Does that at all answer your... Yeah, the one other thing that I was thinking about is that you write about the way that all this sort of, this like push towards frictionless convenience 
Um, which interestingly, I was thinking about again, reading um, Helen Hester and Nick Cernichek's book about the home um, is a desire to take people out of the process, right? Because like messy human interactions, whether that be with a bank teller um, or, you know, the guy at your neighborhood corner store or whatever it is, um, can introduce points of friction in terms of people organizing, in terms of people um, demanding something different, right? So this is what which is, a, which is an element of automation more generally, right? So which you sort of replace um, sort of zones of uh, kind of, not chaos, but sort of uh, an instability um, with stuff that can be controlled from centrally, from central points, right? Um, and yeah, that's, that's a big element. And, and there's a kind of like, um, at, at some level, there's a, and this uh, maybe too late in the evening for me to talk about this, but there's, there's a kind of like weird, circular pointlessness to a lot of the automation rhetoric, right? Because, um, you know, it sort, of, it sort of always starts as this thing of saying, oh, it's going to save you from toil. But then it, every time you, you get rescued from the imagined toil, your, your new position will also be under threat, right? To so be like, you know, we, we turned you into, a, into an accountant. Um, now we're going to try and, like, take away the accountant position. And the next thing that you, that you, you try to get to will also try to take that away right, through automation. So there's a, there's a kind of like a, at some point, a sort of logical um, pointlessness to the, to the process of endless automation, um, which starts to, as some people start to realize it. Um, my last thing I'll say, is, sorry, I'm, I'm hogging this a bit. I was recently at a, at a, at a lawyer conference with all these, these lawyers. And it's the first time I've ever seen um, pretty, like, you know, they're, they're corporate lawyers. They work for big companies being really freaked out by technology, right? Because they suddenly realized this technology actually threatens their own jobs, right? These high-end service jobs, which they previously thought were, were free from this, this type of... Um, and uh, and I, it was a very, very interesting moment where I suddenly realized actually a lot of people are starting to realize this sort of basically kind of like a fundamental pointlessness to the automation process. Yeah, he said the and Z think, word, Quinn. <laughs> yeah, he said a lot of interesting stuff. I mean, I think it's partially also because lawyers have been the quickest to integrate things like right, chat GPT into their own practice, right? Just dumping a huge amount of data and evidence into something to search for different um, recurring data points. But I, I think I, I agree with you that much of the discourse is used to induce a kind of uh, anxiety or a fear of replacement amongst workers that they need to be constantly upping their own productivity and innovating to make sure that the robot at their heels doesn't you know, consume them. Um, Welcome to my industry. But, yeah, just you know, you know, Oh my gosh, terrible. Um, the politics of money on the far right, I think are really interesting too. Like uh, you mentioned Maloney, but the opposition to central bank digital currency has become now kind of like a go-to riff for a lot of people on the right um, alongside many of what they see as other aspects of like the Great Reset, which they assume to be rolled out from the heights of Davos by Klaus Schwab. Um, the AFD, the Alternative for Germany Party, has some of its roots in this sort of politics of hard money, not just the kind of gold bug community, but also this extraordinary conspiracy, which ended up becoming kind of part of actual politics, which was that um, the Americans had confiscated all the German gold and sort of melted it down and kept it for themselves, which um, was sort of half true in the sense that the gold was not held locally in Germany during the Cold War, was held in the Federal Reserve. Um, and they badgered and produced such a publicity campaign that the Bundesbank then needed to, with some um, great visibility, bring back part of the gold reserve from the United States to Germany. So this fear of like d disappearing value and the, the fear that, you know, you, with a click of a button, suddenly money can, can vanish, which indeed it can, I think is being politicized. And I, I expect that to be something that will be politicized even more in the next few years. Um, I think that CBDC is going to be a big dividing line, it, however manufactured and real it is. What I was going to say to your original question, Sarah, on the capitalism and democracy point, I think that you know that really is kind of the point of, of my book. Be, it's not for nothing that the German translation is capitalism without democracy. That's what they called it. Um, and I think what I'm going at there is something like a big story that's been told about 
the global history towards the end of the 20th century, right? So that I think that one thing that people often assume or take for granted is that by the end of the 1990s, this sort of troubled relationship between capitalism and democracy had been kind of reconciled into some kind of a working happy marriage, which is how Martin Wolf repeatedly describes it in his recent book about, de uh, about democracy and capitalism, that you know, there's, there's tensions between the two. You have an inequality of, of, of wealth within capitalism that can only be ever partially counterbalanced by the equal distribution of votes within democracies. But there was, there was some way that they, they balanced each other off and allowed for a kind of an ever-expanding pool of resources and the, the horizon of growth kept stretching out um, into the distance. The point of my book was to say that even at that time, um, there were many people who disagreed, who thought actually in the 1990s and back to the 1970s, at the very time we would think like neoliberalism starts to win, Thatcher, Reagan, Clinton, Blair, Schroeder, it seems like neoliberalism is just stacking up victories. Like capitalism seems to be getting more radical through the democratic process. People are voting in their own kind of butchers, so to speak, when it comes to the dismantlement of the social state, the dismantlement of many of the protections that they had worked and fought for in the post-war years. You know, people were actually electing their own kind of hangmen. Um, so one would think that, and that would be kind of, I think, like the David Harvey kind of interpretation that, you know, democracy and capitalism were working somehow in lockstep through these um, comprador social democratic parties and right-leaning conservative parties. So one needed to, you know, build social movements or, you know, figure some other means out of um, changing the system than just the vote. However, as I show in the book, in the 1970s already, um, you had people like Milton Friedman who were not necessarily looking to Pinochet's Chile or Reagan's America or Thatcher's uh, Britain, but specifically getting really excited about the crown colony of Hong Kong. Um, and why the crown colony of Hong Kong? Because there was no democracy. And they said over and over, it's so wonderful to see this sort of textbook case of neoclassical economics realized in, in reality, like back to Brett's point about sort of abstract libertarianism and then actual existing. When they all gathered in Hong Kong in the late 70s, they're like, wow, that division that we often assumed we would have to live with, like compromise, you know, working with aspects of uh, redistributive state or pressure groups, we seem to be not here at all in a place like Hong Kong. So what the alternative narrative I provide in my book is like rather than a kind of a convergence towards a consensus around democracy and capitalism working together that only gets then troubled supposedly around 2016 with the election of a series of far-right populist leaders and the success of their campaigns, my argument is that actually the kind of the model polities from the 1970s and 80s onward have been non-democratic instances of capitalism. I think that Dubai as a kind of a template for and a model of emulation for countries around the world, from the rich countries to poor countries, the centrality of a place like Singapore, the continued kind of charm and allure of a place like Hong Kong, even after the handover, um, tells us something about the kind of horizon of political imagination that there were, that in fact, this happy marriage that Martin Wolf describes was like, was probably never. <laughs> it was only in the portraits or whatever, right? It was only in the family photos. And there was always like a seed of dissent. And that if we look for those multiplied Hong Kongs all around the world, we find all of these funny little zones and strange jurisdictions. And we find a lot of the action is there. A lot of the financial activity is there. A lot of the manufacturing activity is inside of these enclaves, these sort of mini Hong Kongs. And it doesn't provide, I think, like a magic formula to understand everything about global capitalism, but definitely like putting on the zone glasses, I think, helps to complicate sometimes an overly simplistic binary between like an era of globalization versus an era of nationalism. 
in fact, globalization works through creating new geographies rather than like smoothing out differences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the other things that, that um, I've thought about by reading both of your work is sort of this, this tension between sort of enclosure and exit, right? Um, whether people want to sort of exit the messy democracy of, you know, the U.S. and go move to Puerto Rico to make a Bitcoin heaven or um, create a weird little, you know, capitalist heaven in the middle of South Africa. Um, on the one hand, people want to exit. On the other hand, they also want to enclose. And Brad, of course, you're writing about sort of the enclosure of the money system by private companies and cash in some ways as a way of exiting that kind of control and exiting a certain kind of surveillance. But also you write about the same Bitcoin dudes and their same, you know, weird desires to, um, yeah. So I wonder, I don't know if that sparks anything for, for either of you thinking about those two issues as maybe intention, maybe not intention. I mean, uh, yeah, my, my writing on, my writing on cash is, uh, I mean, I, I frame it in terms of balances of power in the monetary system. Um, I haven't really thought of cash as an exit per se, Bear in mind, cash is still the most dominant used form of money in the world, right? So, so um, we're not talking about a sort of small, you know, libertarian fantasy of, you know, a crypto token or something. You know, cash is by far the most, you know, uh, foundation for all monetary systems around the world, um, uh, because it's it's state issued money, right? And so, in most countries, cash is the only form of state issued money you can access. Right, and the monetary systems are tiered, or they, they they're kind of um, multi-layered. So there's at least three, probably there's more layers than that. But like, you know, at a base level, there's at least three layers in the monetary system. There's the sort of the state layer, um, the sort of like tier one money, what they would call base money, right? Which is the sort of um, yeah base level form of money, which in most countries takes the form of cash, right? Um, and then there's a second layer, which is like bank issue digital casino chips, um, which are, you know, what you would call your bank account, <laughs> right? And that's the so the so-called cashless systems. So when you're looking at the dynamics of the of the cash versus digital money debate, there's a lot more going on there, right? Because actually all the so-called cashless systems are actually underpinned by the layer one system, which is to say, if you destroy the cash system, you have severe problems with the cashless system, you know. I don't know that. Uh, so, so cash is like a, like a complex, a complex topic in that sense. Um, just to flick back to that CBDC point that, that Quinn was making, actually, one of the reasons why nation states right now or central banks are thinking about CBDC is precisely because cash has been undermined, right? And they say because we have a multi-layered money system where the central bank forms an anchor. If you destroy public access to central bank money, aka you undermine the cash system. You're going to have severe problems of instability in the so-called cashless system, right? Because it's anchored to the, the the first layer system. Therefore, we need to perhaps introduce a new form of digital money, uh, sort of a layer one type of digital money, which is the so-called CBDC, um, and that's what's now sp in the sort of um, libertarian right populist mind is triggering all this paranoia, all right? Because um, the monetary system already is largely digital. Um, but because they're so primed towards a sort of state versus market thinking, they often can't perceive the existing digital money, which is run by the banking sector, as being a sort of threat to democracy. Right? It's only when the state talks about the hypothetical possibility of introducing its own that they suddenly like, digital money is coming to take over our system. All right? um, so that's kind of like the cash debate. Uh, but in terms of you know, the dynamics in the global economy, in terms of the enclosure... Um, you know, going back to this point around expansion and acceleration in capitalist systems, it's basically more efficient to have mass scale systems, right? If, you, if your priority is how do you speed things up and automate things, you want mass scale systems, right? Amazon wants like gigantic globally interconnected monetary systems. It doesn't want nationally separated systems, right? So actually Amazon loves stuff like, you know, the Visa and MasterCard intermediated digital payment systems, because uh, it can't operate with fragmented cash systems, right? So in terms of what the sort of global, if, you, if you're imagining global capitalism as an entity with some kind of desire, what it wants is to destroy the cash system, right? Um, but that, of course, is, is an enclosure process, right? Um, 
And then in the sort of libertarian crypto imagination, they can see that and what they then imagine is a way to uh, escape that, some of that, that, that process, a that kind of creeping enclosure. But because also in lo lots of libertarian circles, they don't like being anti-private business, they also quite like a lot of automation processes. So in crypto circles, they want to maintain the automation fetish whilst sort of getting rid of the imagined enclosure aspect. So they say we want to keep the sort of hyper automation vision whilst sort of flattening the hierarchy. And that's what the sort of crypto, a lot of the crypto fetishism is about, right? Um, the one thing they'll never think about is protecting the cash system, right? Because that's doesn't, that doesn't gel with the automation line, right? Um, occasionally they will, but, but like, you know, if you hang around like eth Ethereum circles and stuff, people are basically very Silicon Valley in their thinking. I mean, a couple things that came to mind when you were talking. I mean, one is this idea of the contradiction between sort of exiting existing monetary systems into crypto systems, which nonetheless still are very attracted to the idea of like scalability and frictionless interactions. I mean, this is that runs into always the basic contradiction that the blockchain is not an efficient way to do, you know, integration uh, interactions like at scale. So you you can't actually completely, you know, delink from existing financial systems if you want it to be entirely encrypted in the ways that they envision. But but I mean, I, I do think that this idea of whether or not money, whether cash is an exit, is an interesting one because I completely agree with you that under Current circumstances, it's not. It only has its, it only retains its value by the backstop provided by the central banks and so on. But the imagination or the temporal imagination of a lot of the people that I look at is, it, it constantly is overshadowed by this, this category, which is like a portmanteau word that I've like yet hesitated to actually put in print, but a money apocalypse, <laughs> you know, like like the moment at which if the financial system breaks apart, the the central bank is no longer able to back up all of the claims um, that and 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 liabilities and so on that exist in the in the financial system, and will not even necessarily respect hard currency. So that's the that money apocalyptic vision is the world in which a lot of you know really hardcore. Uh, libertarians and crypto people live. Yeah, but That's Bitcoin what, is especially. Yeah, and like, and they, and they, of course, and this is something I I'm, have written about and I'm finishing writing about now is like they profit from the continued uh, sense of hysteria and fear by you know drawing in customers towards their um, supposed insurance against the coming apocalypse. So this is like very much like the Balaji, Srinivasan uh, modus operandi. So I think that then the question is interesting, which is like. Given a prospective collapse of the global monetary system, which they're constantly predicting, um, what will then be the means of payment and the kind of store of value and so on? Um, usually that's where they come back to gold. Um, the idea that crypto will continue to function even in, after the, uh, the end of the financial system as we know it is increasingly far-fetched if it was ever credible. I, you know, it's, I never thought it was, but I don't even understand how people would claim that it was. Um, but I think that this is all just to say that I think your question, Sarah, about, about kind of exit and enclosure, I think it really rests on the, the kind of um, the centrality of crisis in the mentality of a lot of the far right and the idea that you cannot judge things according to the status quo right now like politics is always future politics in the sense that it's always prepping politics it's right it's like anticipatory of the coming collapse and the way that they distinguish themselves from all of the sheeple and the normies and the basic masses is that not everybody realizes the end is coming we do right that's the first mark of an insider the first mark of being a savant is you're actually part of the group that is aware. And this is pretty mainstream stuff. If you look at like Ray Dalio or Peter Turchin and people that sell a lot of copies, you know, they really flirt with this apocalyptic, I mean, even like Neuro Rabini, right? I mean, this is like sort of what financial commentators do is they say like, this is all about to change. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Um, so... I mean, the stuff that I kind of cover in the book on these lines is a lot of it, I think, 
centers the internet too, because this is where like accident and closure can go together because the dream in the late 1990s for some people and the kind of John Perry Barlow declaration of the independence of cyberspace genre of internet thinking was like, how great, there won't be any property, there won't be any commodities, there won't even be any identities in the old form. We'll all just sort of communicate in this totally open space of like chat rooms or whatever. Already at that time, like the crypto heads like Tom Bell or whoever were, were like, oh no, 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 it's the exact opposite. This is actually a place where we can have pristine property rights, where we actually won't be able to be, we won't have to be concerned about state expropriation and, and things like that. Um, so it actually has opened up a totally new domain for enclosure. The frontier has been reopened. Um, we thought the frontier had been closed. Actually, no, and we have a whole new one now. So you can both exit existing models of of contract and, monet and, and monetary exchange, supposedly, um, and re-enclose at the same time by sort of doing over settler colonialism, but online now, which, which is not a kind of a reach as an analogy. I mean, the, the way that Srinivasan and others talk about it is often you know, rooted in this vision of open space to be re-enclosed, to be captured again. So the, the inter just one more thing, the interesting loop back there is to the, your example where you said like, do they want to escape the US by going to Puerto Rico? But of course like, Puerto Rico is in the US. Well, yes. And, and, but I'm not, just, I'm not just saying that, yeah, but I'm not just saying that as a gotcha, I'm saying yeah. that because the interesting thing right. about Puerto Rico is it's both in and out of the US. Yeah, like it is exactly. this kind of, it is this kind of artifact of empire. And if we want to create a kind of a world atlas of, of exit and new forms of enclosure, often it goes to these places that are um, artifacts of empire, right? The Grand Cayman Islands, um, the Chagos Islands, the, you know, the Puerto Rico, um, places like Honduras that over their history have been quasi-colonized by, you know, freebooters from the United States. Um, that's... I think the, the interest for me as a historian is it draws attention back to like the lumpiness and diversity, diversity and strangeness of the era of empire, you know, where like places were not just painted red and they're another part of the British empire. They'd have a different status. They'd be concession, a treaty port, a crown colony. And a lot of the arbitrage that happens now for reasons of getting an edge on tax avoidance or lowering labor costs is very similar to things that were happening in the 19th century where you sort of come up with local domestic bespoke sets of laws and regulations that make it easier for you to do something here than it would be to do next door. And then you can kind of, you know, act as a broker between those two spaces and make, and make profits. Yeah. 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 Um, you've touched on about five different questions that I want to ask and I'm trying to decide which one to go to next. Um, but I think actually, because you talked about, um, the internet as a space of, of pristine property rights. Um, I want to touch on that now, which is like, right. We are seeing all of these ways to sort of create like bizarro forms of property that no one needed, like NFTs, um, virtual worlds, like the metaverse that no one asked for, um, virtual currencies that no one asked for. Um, and then this goes along with, there's a, a striking bit in Brat's book where you talk about um, an Ethereum engineer referring to governments as outdated operating systems. Um, this way that like Silicon Valley brain sort of poisons how people think about the real world, but also like thinking about property the way that people have thought about it in the real world um, is, in, it, it's also sort of insane if you look at the internet, right? The idea that like, I need to pay, you know, 20 grand for an ugly JPEG of a monkey. I mean, thankfully, NFTs seem to be over. But, you know, these weird, weird ways that, like, you sort of can actually, I think this could be useful for the left. It's just, like, it, it reintroduces the strangeness of private property into any of these discussions by looking at it through these lenses. I remember someone saying that, like, at the height of the NFT thing, like, if nobody can pump some crazy NFT scam right now and then give it all to like 
working class organizations, then this is a serious failing of creativity amongst leftists. <laughs> and surprise, surprise. Was it Malcolm Harris? We failed. <laughs> no, I think that it was like Gavin. I think it was. I think it was Gavin. Uh, Gavin Mueller. Taylor. Oh yeah. Also yeah. a Gavin take. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but again, that's just like another story about yeah. like if if you're going in, in the stream or against the stream, you know that's the that's the real question. Yeah. One of the one of the most fascinating things about NFTs is they weren't really even property right. rights, right? They were they're the very weak property rights. Yeah. yeah, sort of like owning like a signpost that points to something, right? Rather than actually the thing itself. And and uh, it kind of like that that was one of the most interesting sort of. Um, I actually, I actually refuse to comment on the NFT uh, thing <laughs> when it happened, and I just kind of like, I just kind of bypassed it. Yeah. yeah, it was like the hype cycle. I just, smart. Told, I, I was I went straight, yeah. th- straight through it, and just, yeah. it just it joined everyone on the other side. Yeah, it was like, what's the point of wasting time on this? Which is like clearly just like, yeah. kind of there's some capital sloshing around that's now being is not prepared to even put money towards thing that doesn't does doesn't actually give them true property rights. Yeah, which is quite amazing if you think about it. Yeah. Right? Um, it's kind of desperation or I guess a, a kind of greater fool sort of um, uh, market hysteria process. Where yeah. They're like, well, let's ride it to see how long we can, we can go with it for. But the, the fool um, point that you said actually I think is, is interesting, right? Because what Quinn was saying about like be, pe- there's a real – obsession with like being a mark versus being a, you know, being in on the thing, whether we're talking about like being red pilled or, um, you know, the sort of have fun, staying poor culture of uh, whatever. Yeah. And I think there's also, if you have a completely disillusioned attitude towards what is valuable in the world and you think that everything is essentially a scam, which I think, you know, a lot of people involved in that stuff do, then it doesn't even matter if you're a sucker it just matters that you're a sucker earlier than other suckers, right? If you get the ape before others buy the ape, then you can sell them your ape for more. Simple as that. But, I mean, I did the same, Brent, it's really funny you say that because I remember someone's asking me that like a, a year and a half ago or something. I'd be like, so NFTs, and I was just like, ask me in a year, next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, <laughs> but, it's like but such I, a bore, it's just so boring. <laughs> but I, in, I've in the meantime figured out something I think is actually interesting about them, which is exactly related to what you were just pointing to which is like the weakness of the claim of ownership you actually have over your like you know split spliff smoking ape um because actually i think it's a lot more there's a kind of like a secret georgism in the nft model which is also not so secretly a big um undercurrent which in some ways cuts against like homesteading style libertarianism for our listeners who don't know what is georgism well, I mean, that's almost like asking what is Peronism at okay, this point. Okay, fair. But, but, like, like... but Henry George was an extremely influential thinker at the end of the 19th century and believed that there should be a tax on land value. And as he's been taken up by thinkers since, sometimes um, the way that people think about Georgism in practice is about not having outright claims of kind of... Um, fee simple kind of freeholds over property, but property is kind of owned in in common, and then you own a kind of a short term claim on a patch of property or a, a home or a unit in an apartment building or something, and as the value of that land appreciates, you t- uh, uh, you get some of it, but so does the kind of collective governing entity. So some people have written about Singapore, actually, as like an example of Georgism in action in the sense that it's 90% of the housing is owned by the state, but people have their own kind of contracts and they own it as well. So they have, they gain some of the, the value. And some of these crypto or um, anarcho-capitalist heads, sort of Asian is a good example, are kind of secretly, um, and maybe not so secretly, thinking along those lines. So I saw a very interesting um, podcast conversation between Srinivasan and someone, and and Srinivasan was saying, like, yeah, we got to go. We're going to start new communities. We're going to go out to the middle of nowhere. We're going to find some virgin land somewhere, and and then we're going to bring our friends, and it'll be great. And the the person said, okay, so how will, so people will own what, like, plots of land? And, and he's like, oh, no, 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 the investor will own all of the land. And the person was like, oh, wait, oh, really? Like, in this libertarian homestead, you won't actually own the property you live in? He's like, that's correct. <laughs> you know, you will sign a contract saying that you'll get some of the, appreciate some of the land value, but eventually, but, you know, it's the, the, 
the person who comes in with the original stake, which is very much like the two-tier shareholder model that Silicon Valley has you know, made normal now, that the founder has like actually uh, levels of power and ultimate ownership and say that would have been foreign to like corporate governance thinkers in the 1960s or 70s, right? Um, so I think that there's, um, there's that sort of side of things, which if we want to see things that are recuperable for more progressive causes, I think that idea of actually muddying the waters between collective ownership and outright private property is actually good, right? I mean, you know, you could really at this point do like a real counterintuitive, like reclaiming the NFT idea for the left kind of a thing, <laughs> which I absolutely am not going to do. Yeah. But like, but the, that fogginess, I still find really like something we shouldn't overlook. Like, mm-hmm. we should... there, there, I mean, that already exists in many ways. I mean, in the NFT communities, there's lots of people who perceive themselves as being politically left wing, right? Yep. It's, it's quite, it's well, quite different to like a Bitcoin community. Right. Um, especially lots of these sort of like arts mm-hmm. people and yeah. stuff. True. Who yeah, like, um, and actually, crypto in general is quite interesting for these weird ideological hybrids, right? Because it's it's in some ways it kind of created this topsy turvy field where all sorts of kind of delusions and imaginations can be kind of projected into it. Um, and part of that is to do with the fact that in crypto, there's a kind of fundamental ambiguity with the at least in the original Bitcoin, it kind of has two logically separate components. Well, they're not, they're not operationally separate, but they can kind of be philosophically separate, which is the sort of the, the so-called de- decentralization aspect of it, which is like we're going to spread, spread power across a network rather than having it in central intermediaries, which actually politically appeals to a whole bunch of different groups, including like libertarians, but also like left-wing anarchists and weird like, you know, rangeland yeah, I don't know, permaculturists. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of people who kind of resonate with that vision. Um, and then there's uh, the heavily conservative aspect of Bitcoin was the sort of commodity fetish around, around money, right? The sort of hard-coded sort of um, uh, money as a kind of limited commodity that must be rationed, right? And whoever holds it uh, keeps power and so on. So th- that's a historically <laughs> a highly conservative ideology, right? Um, and but the, in the subsequent waves of crypto, where that got broadened out, actually sort of opening the way for many different sort of ideological hybrids. So Ethereum, in particular, you find a huge sort of weird mix of like this highly engineering-based mentality. So you mentioned the people who sort of think about um, governments as operating systems, right? This is like the sort of engineer mindset, which is like the world is a series of optimization problems. Right. And actually, there's no such thing as politics. Really, there's just like, you know, game theory. You've got to sort of balance off these kind of like uh, economically incentivized active actors against each other to kind of create a kind of social machine kind of thing through contracts. Like that's the sort of very engineery thing meets some version of libertarian thought. Um, but, you know, those guys are that they still exist, but they kind of took a big hit because people started to realize that the kind of hard coded vision of. Um, smart contracts, which they were p- promoting, were actually incredibly naive and incredibly um, rigid, right? So actual human society is messy and it involves discussions and politics. And so actually in the years following the kind of initial boom in Ethereum, um, there were so many sort of scandals and disasters that actually a whole new realm emerged in the crypto world around crypto governance, where they started bringing in democratic processes to say, actually, if you hold our tokens, then you can have a say in voting for staff. And so they started reintroducing a bunch of kind of um, human governance institutions into certain crypto protocols. And that brought more left-leaning people to some extent. Because bear in mind, in the original version of crypto, um, the whole sort of way of thinking was market-based uh, exit governments. So going back to this question around exit, that's also a sort of market thinking, right? So like if, if, you, if you don't like a product, just walk away, right? Vote with your feet. You know, you, you have no say on how the product is manufactured, right? But you do get to choose whether you're going to use it or not, right? And that's a sort of a kind of exit thinking and, and market thought, right? Which is like, um, the only point of democracy in the market is where you decide if you're going to use it, the thing or not, Right? Um, and so in the original crypto vision, it was very much like what you do as a founder is you create a finished product, 
you put it out there, people don't get to comment on your product. They just get to decide whether they use it or not, right? If you don't like it, leave, right? And this is, uh, has this sort of like uh, exit mentality to it. Um, but that has now become actually buried under a bunch of other stuff in crypto, which has more of this like, actually, we need governance processes within these, these um, platforms that, we, that we're building. So it's becoming a very politically muddy area of the, the yeah. whole crypto world. Yeah. Can I just say something on that? Yeah, absolutely. The, there's the kind of exit voice loyalty, uh, Hirschman idea that's at the heart of that. Um, but there's also this great, something you gestured to, but I just thought I'd like pick it up and punctuate it. Like this recurrent paradox, right? Where like you have the promise of decentralization and then the reality of like um, hyper-centralization where like a few Bitcoin exchanges became like the places through which almost all the transactions sort of were funneled. Um, another example of that is when you try to do this kind of government by choice or by consent idea. Most concretely, this was carried out through the, the multiplication of gated communities and um, common interest developments or homeowners associations in the United States and really all around the world from the 1990s really spiking. And when you read the people that, uh, who were supporting this development, they always use this idea like, well, it's good to have a range of choices. People have different preferences. People should be able to choose the kind of laws they want to live under. For some people, maybe it wanted to be more libertine. Other people want it to be more um, conservative. But in fact, when you look at the contracts that people are forced to sign to become members of gated communities, they're almost all exactly the same. Like the, the pressures of insurance companies, basically, and the overarching uh, pressure of like preserving the value of your investment means that in almost all cases, you know, there's more <laughs> regulation on your life than if you had bought a home outside of the gates of the community. So rather than being sites for a kind of experimentation and new sort of evolution of new forms of lifestyle and governance, it's the opposite. They're actually rid they're like these rigid islands of conformity in a larger uh, country that in many cases has genuine places for more experimentation. Um, so it seems like that's always th the paradox that comes back to me is that these people that are trying to escape and exit are always finding themselves in places that are more regulated, less actually free, and, and, and like with less space for genuine autonomy and self-making than the places from which they fled. Can I just note that um, the gated community that my mother lives in in South Carolina is called a plantation? because um, they're just making it real obvious yep. there. Um, that's just a thing. <laughs> that's straight out of Neil Stevenson. That's yeah, so crash. Exactly. They have it's like just, a franchise yeah. of plantation. Yeah, yeah that's, just, <laughs> that's just real. That's just what they call them in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So you get like mm -hmm. nice Northeastern Jews like my dad moving down and buying property in a plantation. And you're just like, really? Really? Well, the funny thing is, you know, if he had stayed in Massachusetts, then he would be staying in like old colonial acres or something, right? That I mean, too. it wouldn't be any better. Well, but. you know, for a little while, we lived in a, uh, a little development that was called uh, Algonquin Homes that was all named after all of the native people that they had displaced. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice. So that was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, America. So, um, <laughs> although, you know, I'm talking to a Canadian and a South African, so we can all just be like, yeah, mm -hmm. collective <laughs> embarrassment. Um, <laughs> on a podcast hosted in Britain. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's all their fault. It's all their fault anyway. Um, yeah, so so talking about all this stuff, um, I'm, I'm brought up to a question that, again, I was going to ask a little later in this conversation. I guess we're already kind of late in the conversation. It's fine. Um, that these kind of non-movement-y movements um, are all premise where we're talking about crypto, we're talking about making a weird state lid and whatever, a floating island or whatever it is you want to do. Um, and also, Quinn, I'm thinking about your writing on diagonalism in Germany. Um, it's this idea of, of trustless, right? Brett, you write about Bitcoin being trustless. The idea that trusting other people, that solidarity with other people is impossible. This played out so hugely in all the anti-vax stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm wondering if we can open up this question and think a little bit about like how we think about trust or the lack thereof in today's politics and how... You know, maybe that's leading to everyone from Georgia Maloney to um, Donald Trump's resurgence to Millet and everything else. Well, I mean, I think I mean, it's a complex one because actually trustlessness has different uh, paradigms or, or meanings to it. And it's, if you're an engineer, 
what trustless actually means is a system that doesn't uh, require you to trust people. It doesn't say that you don't trust people. It just says you don't have to trust them. You can actually be a very trusting person, but you, and you might believe in human nature. But if you're designing, for example, um, forget about crypto for a moment. Just think about you're, a, you're an engineer of a large-scale internet system. It might have you know, 10 million users. Um, ideally, you want to protect it from any potential malicious actors. And let's say, that, let's say there's only one malicious actor in a system. Right? You don't want it to be susceptible to that person. Right. So you say a, a trustless system would be like you, you don't, you're not going to worry about that one person causing a problem for everybody else. Right. Now, that's the kind of engineering mentality. Um, but it then, in the crypto world, gets weirdly mixed with libertarian thought where there's a view on human nature, which is that human beings are at some level isolated atoms that uh, act in their own interests. Um, and... At some level, you know, it depends on what version of libertarianism you're looking at. It's got this kind of like, I guess, almost like ethical egoist type of thing where it's like, well, if you leave human beings to their own devices um, and somehow property rights are protected, it will lead to spontaneous order, right? And this creates one of the contradictions in libertarianism, which is that, well, to do that, you need some kind of Leviathan type figure, to protect the property rights, but the Leviathan figure is often run by another human being who's also self-interested. Therefore, you can't trust the person who's supposedly providing the, the, the platform upon which all the others are going to act upon their own self-interest, which is why in the libertarian imagination, crypto became so such a such a like amazing, you know, such a sort of great hope because they're like, we could create this kind of Leviathan-like structure, um, which doesn't rely upon actual human beings which will then enable the isolated atomic individuals to then engage in contract and exchange to act upon their own interests and thereby have this kind of like uh, spontaneous order emerge. And that's the kind of libertarian vision. And then when, when the engineers meet that, you would often have this kind of like crossover because a lot of the engineers in these circles often weren't necessarily politically, well, you know, they, they didn't specialize in thinking about the dynamics of, you know, monetary systems and politics. So often sort of just by kind of default sort of drifting into libertarian thought or mixing the engineering version of trustlessness, uh, which is like we don't want to be dependent upon trusting people with the libertarian vision, which is people are untrustworthy, all right? And not only people, but especially specifically governments who are groups of people are particularly untrustworthy, right? Um, and... Yeah, and they had a very naive, naive idea about how sort of trust works in a society because, you know, the, the reason why the monetary system works is not because of trust, right? Um, the monetary system largely works through power and network effects, right? It, it doesn't, doesn't rely upon you actually trusting the institutions in most days, right? Um, so they had a particular vision that the, the only reason that the monetary system was held up was through some kind of act of collective belief. Uh, and so... Those are some various aspects mm -hmm. of the trust question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the phrase that was bouncing around my head is the sort of Reagan era idea of trust but verify about arms control. But in this case, it's kind <laughs> of like don't trust but verify, right? Because yeah. verification systems become all the more important in sort of trustless automated systems. Wouldn't that be true to be able to yeah. you yeah. know, prove that you are who you are could never be something that would be taken on faith. But... It's interesting because I often in the writings I've been doing by following like actual existing sort of political movements inspired by libertarian ideas or the kind of the more successful libertarians, I often find that the ones who are successful are the ones who tend to um, augment this idea of like the monadic, egoistic, completely individualistic um, actor with something extra. So I'll give you an example. In Charles Murray, you know, author of The Bell Curve, famous author also of Why I Am a Libertarian, has this incredible speech. So I'm, I'm just sort of finishing a book now and it'll be in the introduction because he's writing in the 1990s. And he's basically saying, we've been very successful in um, helping to lead the dismantlement of many parts of the social state and forms of dependency 
that we um, have been criticizing for decades. What we haven't necessarily prepared for is what will happen if we completely succeed. Like what if the state is actually um, deconstructed altogether? What will the day, he, he says he say, says something like, this is the problem of the day after. Um, we will need to reconstitute some form of collective life that is no longer mediated through this an automatic uh, relationship to governments as they've been traditionally understood. So we're going to need to create more horizontal, more contractual, more self-reliant, definitely smaller spaces of social life and social organization through the kind of realization of like the subsidiarity principle that conservatives often talk about but don't always realize. Like what if everything is actually decentralized? And then, you know, he even as a libertarian is like just seeing people as people who we can barter and truck with is not going to be enough. We are going to need something to act as like an adhesive, like a social glue that goes beyond simply economic rationality. And that's where he and many of his fellow kind of paleo libertarians in the 1990s start coming back to questions of race and questions of culture, which is like, well, I'm not, a, you know, this is, they would say something like, you know, I'm not a racist by disposition, someone like Murray Rothbard, Jewish, um, sympathetic to different forms of politics, whether practiced by white people or black people but who is, as a kind of anthropological insight as he saw it, felt that common race, common culture, like decreased transaction costs, produced a sense of trust where one might not otherwise exist and could actually be like a necessary component for this post-state form of living. Um, so that, you know, shotgun marriage between basically full-on scientific racists, neo-Confederates, uh, kind of cultural nationalists that happened in the 90s and continues through something like the Alternative for Germany Party, the Bolsonaro movement in Brazil, um, where you have people that care mostly about kind of blood and soil stuff teaming up with people who care mostly about like free market fundamentalism stuff is based on, I think, this idea that you can't do away with trust in the end. In the end, you need to reconstitute even if you manage to build more automated forms of, of money creation, um, you'll still need to have that embedded in a new kind of, uh, a new slash old resuscitated idea of what it, what it means to be uh, part of a particular group. Okay, so um, you brought up, well, the Jews. Um, and also we've been talking about money a lot and conspiracy theories and all of this. And I want to sort of ask rather directly, like, what is it about money that makes money so central to all of these sort of more or less conspiracist, more or less sort of um, fantasist ideas of, of how the world works? Um, and is the answer just actually latent anti-Semitism all the way down? Let me say one thing and then see if we can connect it to the sort of racist um, or, you know, kind of ethno-nationalisty kind of things because there's also there's a particular uh i guess like a paradigm or like suite of ideas that work together with particular ways of thinking about money um so and i don't know if i'd be able to stitch these all together in my head right now but but like libertarianism as a sort of general impulse um obviously again there's variations but one of the sort of generalized impulses in libertarianism is your, your background imaginary of the world is of sort of Tarzan-like figures, right? If you think about, think about how a text, uh, an economics textbook starts, you have fully grown adults who just sort of walk into a forest clearing, like two Tarzans walk up and they suddenly try to do a deal with each other, right? This creates your supply and demand curves and stuff, right? But they, but they basically imagine these sort of isolated individuals. This is your background sort of imaginary that, that's sort of lurking there. Um, and then you imagine that humans form societies through these, uh, that these individuals precede the networks, right? That the network is created through voluntary action of the individuals, right? That, that the, the network of people doesn't precede the individual. Um, 
and within that imaginary, you sort of you see an economy as like a gigantic collection of people who move objects around. I mean, Marxists would probably just call this, you know, a kind of commodity fetishism and alienation and this kind of stuff, right? You just sort of see this, this, sort of, this gigantic collection of objects, right? Um, rather than an enmeshed sort of structure. Um, and within that, there's a particular vision that if you, uh, if you, that that's things like trade are optional, right? If you don't want to trade, you just walk back into the jungle, right? <laughs> it's just a choice. You somehow used your bodily energy to produce something from somewhere, and now you're going to try and get somebody else to give you something for what, what that they produced, right? So you imagine that somehow people have had this like priest, the stock of energy that they've used to make something, and now they're going to try and trade, right? And this is your sort of starting position of imagining an economy and sort of a libertarian way of thinking. Um, and that means when you think about money, what you start to think of money as is a kind of like a commodity-like object that you use to induce another person to give you another commodity-like object. So it creates this vision of money as a kind of commodity-ish thing, um, which is used to form a temporary bridge between two isolated individuals who afterwards will go back to their point of isolation, which is what they call equilibrium. Right, so you you always retreating back to the sort of individual state, um, and within that vision, to make that vision work, you basically need to think of money as a commodity. All right, and so if you look about how commodity visions of money function in libertarian thought, it partly is what is required to make that that vision sort of like function properly. At least it's one element, um, and then that's that's that same vision is also how you deny that social you know uh, that people are essentially part of. Um, have are fundamentally in, in, interdependent, right, and have can make right have make claims upon each other, all right, um, because libertarianism will basically say you have no claim upon me, right, unless I allow it to be the case, right. So you basically fundamentally need to deny interdependence largely, um, and so commodity thought about, thinking about money is linked to this denial of interdependence. Right? And in alternative visions of money, which are basically around that money is a form of credit system that sort of weaves together entire um, interdependent meshes of people, that's a very different way of thinking, and libertarians do not like it. All right? They do not like that vision of money. Um, and, so, and this also gets attached to like natural law ideas, that there's sort of these like natural orders that appear from people who are acting in these ways, which then I think to some extent might be tied to then you know, visions of male hierarchies and stuff but I, I don't know i haven't thought deeply enough about that um so maybe quinn you want to riff on that <laughs> yeah no that's that's really fascinating i mean i think of you know what you're describing is as much kind of classical liberalism as right. libertarianism right it sounds like john locke to me and you know as historians have shown locke was talking about these moments of fencing and enclosure and mixing the labor with the soil while he was kind of advising on um the first moments of English settlement in the um, American South. So this, you know, the histories of of settlement and land grabs and plunder are like the raw material for these fantasies of the kind that you I described so well. I was actually thinking about a response which is sort of similar, but but feeds through one of my favorite theorists of one of my favorite theorists of money, who's George Zimmel. The, Ger the German sociologist who I read every time I teach a class on cities. And his basic argument is, can be put pretty simply, which is that you know, when people move from being residents of the countryside to residents of the city, they move from having kind of qualitative relationships with each other, like that person's my second cousin, I've known that person since I was a baby, to having quantitative relationships with each other, where they become mediated through money. So, you know, it's not now, I know that person's uncle, it's like, oh, that person is going to charge me this much money for the service that I'm now going to get from them. And it seems like it's going to be a condemnation of that world of the city of, of money, but actually it ends up being a celebration of it because he says, you know, what do we get for that exchange? Well, we get an internal life. <laughs> we don't have to be surveilled constantly by like someone's uncle, someone's cousin. We can create ourselves anew. Like the city becomes the site for a kind of true kind of autonomy and experimentation and like everything good about actually civilization now comes from cities. Um, I think of this libertarian conundrum is 
similar to what Brett was saying, a kind of a denial of interdependence. Because on the one hand, they are embracing that freedom that comes from something like the city, but they're rejecting the idea that there's also a set of obligations that come with being part of mass society, right? That mass society also produces its own kind of pathologies and problems to which we need to have collective responses or else the city won't work anymore. So that's why you get this paradox where they are like both drawn to that kind of universalized, monetized form of experience that the city provides, but then they always seem to be wanting to get out of the city. Like they're always trying to create, they're trying to create these mini, they're trying to create mini cities on islands and and on outposts. And I'm sorry, cities don't work that way, right? Cities work because of their tremendous diversity and their path dependency and their organic nature. And it's that, it's, I think that anguished attempt to have it both ways that produces this, this like, this, this um, tortured relationship to money because it's both setting them free but kind of drawing them into the very interdependency that you're describing. It's worth noting that that the sort of um, this uh, there's a fundamental bias in society more generally towards imagining money in a type of libertarian way, right? Um, even if you're not a sort of card carrying libertarian, because the existential how, how would I describe it? Um, phenomenological experience of wandering around in a large-scale capitalist system is that you... Um, you are doing those exchanges. Yeah, yeah basically, if you, think, if you think about a kid growing up in a, in a society, what, what are you going to see as you're growing up, right? Like, you, you, you sort of see random strangers all over, all over the place who you, you have no idea who they are um, if, you're in, if you're in a city, right? Um, and then, like, somehow this object seems to mysteriously command them to, to do certain things, right? And... If you're trying to form a quick pathology in your head about what's what's going on, it's like, well, somehow this this object has some kind of power to do this thing, um, and so you quickly lapse into a sort of loose um, metaphoric way of thinking of money as a type of commodity-like thing, and because uh, and the ironic thing is that actually large-scale monetary systems depend upon uh, essentially not being commodities. They have this. Um, they, they appear as assets to us, but actually there's a gigantic shadow liability side that exists in the state and the banking sector. But we only experience the asset side of the monetary system, which is what appears as a commodity to you. Um, so people will loosely only imagine that, that money has, is only an asset, like, a, like, a, like, a, like an object-like thing, so, which, is, which is, starts to map on to pretty much how, like, um, if you look at Bitcoin, for example, the reason why it's, it's sort of gel, it's, it's, sort of, it's quite easy for people to sort of to buy into the Bitcoin vision is it has this asset-only imagination of money. Money is a numbered object that appears before you. It's just an, uh, just, it's just an asset, right? Um, and so this type of thinking pervades society more generally, and the sort of the deep irony in lots of the kind of like libertarian imaginations, um, you know, is that actually a lot of this, th- this thinking is induced by large-scale nation-state infrastructures, mm. right? Um, and on, lots on, of the, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, no, no. I, I just, I was really getting very interested in what you were saying about the kind of phenomenological treatment of money because my son is seven years old. And, you know, if, if even though it is true, as you say, that for the most part, cash still is king globally, in certain milieus, let's say in our family, it's really not. I mean, I have almost never cash in my wallet. Um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, and, and cash is has no talismanic power for him. Like mm. the, the dollar bill is, has no power over him. He looks at it and he doesn't think of it as anything. It's just like looking at another piece of paper. The same way that his friends see me reading a newspaper yeah. and say, what is that you're looking at? And why do you <laughs> keep looking at it? Yeah, <laughs> it yeah, just yeah. happened to be like this last week. Oh. Um, so I'm curious about like, you know, a Zimmel, and maybe you get to this in your book and I just haven't noticed it yet like a Zimmel for the 21st century, like what does it mean when it's all, like for him, it's all the phone. That's where money yeah, yeah. is. Money's yeah. on the phone. Yeah. And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't know how to get at it. Yeah. But, but he knows it's there. And, and I, just phenomenologically, I'm curious, like how does he imagine like having a part of that? Because now it's, yeah, it's yeah. a binary, right? <laughs> like be... as far as he's concerned, my phone has infinite money on it and he has zero, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. right? Which neither of which are true. <laughs> I actually have a friend who who, who uses Zimmel's money theory to talk about infinite scrolling on, on phones as well. Oh wow, yeah. The sort of you know projecting your ego into the sort of like um, theoretically limitless thing. 
mm-hmm. um, which is something that money has this, this quality to it. For sure. Right, because... Um, but uh, that's a bigger topic. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, the, uh, culturally, people will still have a commodity orientation to money, even with digital systems like a phone. But they'll just have right. a, new, a, new, a new vision of what the commodity is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, does this yeah. maybe does that maybe connect to the idea that like someone can therefore hoard all the money or take your money away or like um I don't know like it seems to me that both like that commodity um orientation towards money or like the idea of like these sort of invisible networks of whatever and money that can just like appear and disappear in this little gadget here um both can sort of lend themselves to conspiratorial thinking in different ways um sorry Ben yeah no, I just Thermo, think the, the digital side makes it much more terrifying. I mean, yeah. for sure. The idea that it's just like, boop, nothing's there all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Mar- sorry, this is maybe, I don't want to reopen this, but like a, a, a commodity, commodity orientations to money does, it doesn't make a claim about the physicality. It basically is like money is a thing that holds something, right? Whereas, and actually whether, whether that, that takes the form of like a physical object or a digital object doesn't really matter, um, and also what will often happen with people who have this mentality is that they'll generate imaginations of fictitious value in money. So they'll say, well, even if it's not a real commodity, we, what we do in our minds is we all sort of collectively agree that it has value. So they'll create some story about why the thing is actually a type of commodity. Um, and that you can do with digital objects as well as physical objects. Um, it's actually quite a big problem for me in my cash work because I don't have a, I don't have a commodity viewpoint of money. I see money as credit systems. So, and uh, with so physical cash to me is a, a type of credit that's physically implemented, whereas a digital unit is just a, a credit that's digitally implemented. All right? Whereas some people are, are being like, well, the actual physical money is the real money, whereas the digital stuff isn't real. And that's, that's a very classic sign of like a, an old school commodity type of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's complex. <laughs> Can I just say, as, as a kind of like uh, footnote for listeners who might find that this stuff interesting, Michelle Fair, I think, is the person who has had the most interesting ruminations on the disconnect between neoliberal theory, as we think, read and think about it, in someone like Hayek and Friedman, and the reality of the credit-based money system in which we live. So his argument is that. Like the Hayek never really anticipated financialization or like the, the rapid expansion of the credit uh, base and monetary supply and so on, the way it, it has happened. So that's part of the reason why they're kind of inadequate guides to understanding 21st century capitalism and why they often actually seem quite old fashioned in the way they assume that an economy can work in the same way that crypto heads and gold bugs seem to be imagining a version of reorganizing the economy, which would immediately put an absolute end to any kind of economic growth, you know, would bring to a halt the whole machinery of the world economy. And so you have this paradox where people who seem to be the most devoted to capitalism are actually preaching something that would destroy capitalism, like overnight, if you shrank if like, you, to 100% reserve if, if you, although, although that's only if you assume that they're actually being honest about that vision. That's true. Um, because actually that same vision is also a marketing strategy for yep. a commodity-like object that you can sell within an existing monetary system. Yes. So actually it is, yep. does make sense from a capitalist perspective to yep. have Push a false that. marketing pitch for, yep. for a, a digital collectible. But that's yep. something we didn't. We, did, we could talk about Bitcoin for another two hours. <laughs> yeah. We could talk about all of this stuff for another two hours, and Ben will kill me because he's going to have to edit this. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So, unfortunately, I'm going to ask a, lo- a last question that is also huge. But in thinking about um, all of these structures and the power structures that sort of underlie all of this, all the global capitalist system, um, I'm struck by something that, again, comes up in both of your work that, like, we're still sort of following the old lines of colonialism. You, we sort of, you know, appealed to this a little bit earlier. Um, we're also talking in the morning that the International Court of Justice um, made its initial ruling on South Africa's case against Israel, which is, right, it's ostensibly a decolonial state, which, you know, big, big ostensibly there, um, taking the last settler colony, again, big la- big air quotes around last there to court to challenge these these very old and yet still relevant structures of colonial power um and also there was a fun aside about Israel saying that they're going to put the Palestinians on a um floating island and the Yemenis saying no you can go on the floating island 
Um, but yeah, so as a last sort of question to both of you, I'm going to just sort of ask you to, to think about these, these structures of colonial power and how they're still showing up in even these sort of ultra modern forms of capitalism that we've been talking about. Just a huge yeah. question to end yeah, with. Yeah. I no mean, problem. Look, I'd say you, you you see it in both. I mean, we've talked been talking to some extent about like the crypto world, plus the sort of we touched on you know the kind of um, big finance, tech, cashless, enclosure type things. Um, there's a massive massive aspect of it in the sort of uh, mainstream big tech uh, finance world, um, especially through the financial inclusion communities. Um, where basically in the sort of mainstream financial inclusion world, basically the vision is uh, progress means becoming dependent upon American corporations, right? So we're going to help you become consumers of um, or become dependent on Visa and MasterCard, right? And that there's something wrong with you if you're not incorporated into that structure, right? That you're disadvantaged and you're... Um, and in some ways, there's a, there's a kind of a Stockholm syndrome thing going on because, like, in the global economy, it actually is true that if you, um, if everybody else is syncing up to the gigantic, you know, Visa and Mastercard and all the big players, and you're not, you will start to get shafted, right? So you better get captured by them, otherwise you're going to be quote unquote left behind, right? Um, so then the sort of the, the sort of perverse thing in the financial inclusion community is that they say, okay, well. We're going to like basically onboard you into this s s uh, structure in a subordinate position um, because you have no choice, basically, right? And that is essentially a type of colonial process. And the, although you'll find, for example, in uh, the African context, people will try to talk about digital sovereignty and trying to form their own um, non US systems. Um, but of course, that's a very tricky, tricky process to go through. But you also find the same, the same mentality in the crypto world as well. A lot of, a lot of the crypto. Um, people for all their saber rattling about being sort of anti the system they're often not anti their countries right they often have exactly the same structures of like colonial thought and you know, the guy the sort of crypto guy from the US also believes it would be great if like you know quote unquote africans become dependent upon his system right um which again is a very classic kind of like uh, techno solutionist neo colonialist kind of positions and so that stuff is all over the digital uh, world um, and there 's lots of interesting discussions around to what extent you can actually stand against that or not yeah I mean a, a great example of what you 're describing um, that happened not so long ago is the there 's this one of these little enclave libertarian states uh, statelets of Prospera on an island off the coast of Honduras that um, became targeted by a progressive uh, administration after a new election in Honduras who felt like they shouldn't be giving sort of these extraordinary extra legal rights to a bunch of Silicon Valley investors, quite rightly. And so they're attempting to reverse the kind of privilege that this small um, enclave enjoys. And the libertarians, who included originally Patry Friedman, who also talks about the kind of defunct operating system of the American Constitution and often talks as if they are really pioneers going it alone, breaking away from these legacy states to do their own thing. Um, they immediately filed uh, a case with the international arbitration courts through the Central American Free Trade Agreement and through a bilateral investment treaty with Kuwait, um, arguing, as one of them did, that Libertarians hate international law, yet it turns out it can be really helpful sometimes, right? So the, the idea of the United States as the kind of enforcer of last resort, I think, sits behind a lot of this stuff, either openly uh, conceded or disavowed. But your larger question, I think, is something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I, I started thinking about this about a year and a half ago, and it's only become more relevant since October 7th. But the, um, the difference between these two concepts we use to understand empire, both past and present. I think one of them is settler colonialism. The other is financial imperialism. And if you go a hundred and some odd years back and look at someone like Hobson, one of the first critics of um, British empire from within the, within the empire, you could say, he was talking about financial imperialism. So the problem of empire was that it was 
pushing money that could be invested more productively inside of Britain into colonies abroad, thereby enriching a small number of people and further impoverishing you know, the British working class. So empire was bad because it was being conducted through the kind of export of capital. He thought settler colonialism was actually good because settler colonialism is when white people actually made a commitment to a place and improved the land and, and invested, built their own infrastructure. So Canada was a good colony, something like um, investment in in East Africa or whatever was a bad version of things. In the last 20 years, I think especially since the invasion of Iraq, I, the, the term settler colonialism has had this extraordinary career, right? It's, I think it has become the dominant way now that critical academics and activists think about what empire is. They think about it in very tangible terms. It's about like land grabs, um, plunder, annexation, you know, these, uh, the enclosure in the sense of, of putting new fences and walls around things. People tend not to think about empire now in terms of money as much as they used to, certainly. And if anything, I think that money is and finance is sort of maybe being recuperated through the back door, sometimes for okay reasons. So I, example I'll give you is in the Financial Times, like a couple months ago, there was a piece about how the, is, the IDF was like impounding currency going into Gaza, which was making it all but impossible for people just to get basic things, you know, medicines and food and water, because they had no means with which to, you know, buy things, uh, which brought to mind to me as something I heard Amartya Sen say years ago, that you, you shouldn't be against money as such, that the being against money, he said, would be like being against communication. And the question is, what do you do with this thing, not should you have it or shouldn't you have it? So, you know, for good reason, I think settler colonialism is at the top of our agenda right now. The idea that empire is mostly about just like literally grabbing parts of the earth is compelling for very obvious reasons. But I wonder, you know, you know when, when this conflict comes to whatever kind of end, or even before, because I don't know if it is going to come to an end, I do think we need to start thinking again more systematically about how do we think about like land and money together, right? Like how does finance both enable settler colonialism or maybe in some cases work against it? I think it's an open question, but it's striking to me how much those two conversations have sort of been siloed off into separate discussions, separate conferences, separate publications, separate sort of um, protests. So that's something I guess I hope to see, you know, happening in the next while. Yeah, for sure. Anything else? I could, I could uh, close it off by returning to the, it, yeah. to the um, Argentina thing. So um, one of the, and I, Having said this, I actually don't know if, I, if I'll be able to finish this thought, but um, <laughs> you try one of the one of the um, dollarization questions going on in the world right now is to do with stable coins. That actually, if you remember, okay, an overtly colonial act that happened a couple of years ago was Facebook's Libra project, right? Where basically they said, ditch your own national currency and use our system, right? Um, and the Libra project was essentially a stablecoin project, which basically means a, uh, a third layer digital casino chip attached to the banking sector, which is attached, attached to the central banking layer of the monetary system, right? So basically what Libra would be would be this collection of um, uh, like a bundle of claims upon central banks at some level, all right? Squashed into a single unit. Right? Which, if you're a person, for example, in a country, um, you, you would just see it as, as this, this, this new unit you could use. Uh, but if you're a central banker, you'd be like, this is an attack on our monetary sovereignty at some, at some level. Right? Um, but to a lot of the kind of, especially quite sort of centrist -y, you know, tech publications and stuff, it's like, oh, this is great innovation to help the unbanked. And these are people who are, um, don't have access to, you know, uh, the global banking sector and uh, domination by Visa and MasterCard, et cetera. Um, and uh, that was a very, very pronounced thing. And they started using, you know, my family's um, 
uh, original home country, Zimbabwe, as a kind of classic example of like, well, we could save all the Zimbabweans by having them use Libra instead, right? Um, it's kind of the Sam Altman world coin along. Yeah, yeah, all this kind of stuff, right? So, so they have this incredibly apolitical vision of money, right? Which is that you know, money is not connected to political political sovereignty, right? It's just like it's just some, some sort of weird neutral tool that you use. Um, and of course, if you're an actual democracy activist, a large part of if you're trying to interested in sort of you know rebuilding your country in some way, you often you want monetary sovereignty, right? Uh, so going back to the, the sort of uh, question in Argentina, the whole dollarization stuff is very controversial precisely because you're saying we will give up sovereignty. Um, and But there's, a, there's a sort of these shadow dollarization processes going on in the world right now where because there's these new stablecoin systems um, which don't rely upon having, um, they're not d directly attached to bank accounts, there are new ways that people in these countries are just starting to use the US dollar, right? which is posing a big problem for actual hypothetically for, for uh, central banks at some point, which is to say we're trying to have some degree of um, sovereignty for our currency, but the people are starting to now use the US dollar, right, which is a, a part of an imperialistic structure of some sort. Um, but at sort of an everyday level, a person's like, well, if we start to defer, you know, become dependent upon the US dollar instead of our currency, maybe we'll gain some kind of benefit, right? Um, so the stablecoin question is now becoming part of this debate around the sort of imperialistic power of the U.S. financial system, right? Because they're plugged into the U.S. financial system largely. Um, and it's easier to access them than other forms of digital U.S. dollars. So this is an ongoing question about whether that will really do, um, how it will impact the strength of other countries' monetary systems. Um, and so I'll just leave that question there <laughs> and whether and whether china or india will be able to extend their sort of alternative exactly so there are these these, mm -hmm. these forms of battles going on between between these countries who are trying to get their own currencies via these digital uh, tokenized systems into sort of ordinary transactions between ordinary people in, in um, weaker countries That was our episode, which we could have probably kept going for another two hours, just on those last two questions alone. Um, but everything from what money is and isn't to why and how it enables modern colonial power, um, I think this is a fascinating conversation. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Macrodose Roundtable. We have many more exciting discussions coming up. Let us know your thoughts, questions, and ideas for future roundtables in the comments. Thanks for being with us in Solidarity Forever. <laughs>